This is Death in Ice Valley, an original podcast series from the BBC World Service and NRK. She appears to have been everywhere a stranger, and yet she wasn't alone after all. It was not like they were very friendly to each other. It didn't sound like it was friendly. They were arguing. They weren't smiling or anything like that. I'm Marit Tigroff. And I'm Neil McCarthy. And this is episode seven, Mystery Men. So last thing we knew, the isotope results of the teeth were being sent to the other side of the world for analysis by somebody very well qualified. I have to be basically an astrophysicist, a chemist, a physicist. I have to understand the universe and all these things around us just to solve a simple case. Jurian Hugewerf is a Dutch isotopes expert at the University of Canberra in Australia. He understands what we're made from, down to stardust, and he applies his knowledge to forensic science, helping the police to crack identification cases. And he studied the isotope results of the Istal woman. Remember, these are traces of elements in the teeth, which can indicate where a person grew up based on the food and water they consumed as a child. I'd like to have a very professional approach as a forensic scientist to my casework. So when our colleagues contacted me, I said, well, just give me the, uh, the results of the, the teeth and don't tell me anything about the case because I don't want to have, be biased about where the police might think the person might come from. So when our colleague sent the data, I compared it with the databases that we had. I do a statistical analysis of it and I come up with the most likely areas where a person might have come from. Good. This is a completely unprejudiced analysis. So what did he find? For early childhood, I was quite intrigued by it myself. We see only a few areas that have a higher likelihood in Europe. And we see that in the, the eastern part Middle Germany, there's some areas maybe in Eastern Europe, the Balkan area, there's a spot in Spain. Looking at the isotope map he gave us, there are a few spots highlighted, as he says. But the real hotspot is in the southeastern part of Germany, and it's centered on the Nuremberg area. That's incredible to think her teeth can give us a vital clue like this. So that's her early childhood, but different teeth form at different times. What about when she's a bit older? There's evidence of movement of the person from the teeth that we had analyzed between early childhood and the teenage years. We see some changes. Looking at the time frame, and this, um, that's around the Second World War. There was a lot of movement going on in those years. Why did she move? We cannot tell them, but there was a lot of movement. So we see areas, partly in the UK, we see areas more Western Germany, Belgium, that area, part of France, part of Spain. Uh, Italy, there's different areas. So she's moved away from the Nuremberg area by her teenage years. But there are a few options as to where she went next. Looking at this second isotope map, the biggest hotspots are the French-German border area and also the sort of Luxembourg-Belgium area and there's another good hotspot over North Wales. And there are some other spots scattered about in Europe, as he says. So there are a few places for us to look into then, Marit. We can combine these results with the other information we have so far. We know that the dental work wasn't from the UK, but probably from Germany or Eastern Europe. And combined with all the witness testimony that she spoke poor English, it doesn't make Wales very likely. But these are results from her childhood. And remember, there was World War II and people were displaced. So a lot may have happened to her afterwards. Now, this isn't a fail-safe method, but it's the closest we've got to narrowing down the places she lived in. The hotspots cover relatively large areas, though, so we'll have to think about how to use this information. But it's exciting. It's somewhere to look. Bergen are also following these developments, which are using the latest forensic technologies. Nils Jarle Jövog is the head of the forensic department there. With uh, the new technology, we have found out that Zim can come from Germany, France, and what we knew, now we're looking into is to do a, a C14, a carbon 14 
carbon analysis? Yeah. Of uh, what? Uh, of, of the teeth to find out uh, maybe what year she was born. Then we will be a little bit closer. The carbon-14 method that he's talking about is an exciting cutting-edge experiment to date the teeth more accurately. And it uses a special ingredient from the Cold War. We're just waiting for the Norwegian police to take the teeth to an institute in Sweden that specializes in this analysis, because we're going there with them. Back to 1970. We've been discussing the Soviets and their interest in the Penguin missile tests. Well, I thought I'd contact somebody with very good espionage credentials to give his assessment about whether the Istal woman was spying for the former Soviet secret services, the KGB. He's now a writer and historian living in London, but he has insider knowledge. I was trained for two years as a spy in the spy school that was called the Andropov Red Banner Institute of the KGB. This is Alexander Vasiliev. We've shown him the relevant documents. So what does he think? I'm sorry to disappoint you, (laughs) but I don't think she was a Soviet spy. She had all the labels on her clothes cut off. And some people believe that It proves she was a spy because she was trying to hide her real identity. But uh, let me tell you this. If she was a Soviet spy, she would be wearing clothes bought in Norway or clothes bought any other country according to her legend. Let's say she presented herself as a woman from Belgium. She would be wearing clothes bought in Belgium. To blend in. Yes, to blend in. To blend into her story. Absolutely, absolutely. To support her legend, right? Legend, it means, well, the backstory, the invented story of a spy. This is one thing. Another thing is that she had too many fake names. If she was a Soviet spy, she would have had solid documentation and I mean, passports, birth certificates, and so on. And that's a very difficult thing to do, right? So she would have had one, maximum two fake identities because all this should have been uh, organized. You know, it it takes time. You have to find people, dead people, for instance, whose names this uh, particular spy could adopt and uh, on whose names the fake documentation would would have been uh, prepared for her. People are saying that she had about a dozen identities. I I, I can't believe it. It's it's, it's impossible. The third thing which drew my attention is that uh, people who met her are saying that she smelled of garlic and it told them that she was a foreigner. Well, let me tell you that a Soviet spy operating in the field wouldn't be smelling of garlic. She would be smelling of Chanel Number no. 5. And another thing, there were not many female spies in, in the KGB. What do you believe then? Why, why does a person in 1970, a woman, travel around on her own with eight different identities. Who, who do a thing like that, if you're not a spy? And have the funds to do so. The money. Mm. Yeah, it's... Uh-huh. No, I think she was a spy. But the question is for whom she was spying. I don't know. <laughs> it's very intriguing. out the Russian angle. 
How interesting that Chanel number no. five would be a giveaway clue for a female Soviet spy. Have you got any of that in your collection? I couldn't possibly say, you know, secrets are secrets. But the question still remains, if she was a spy, who was she spying for? Apart from the story about the Easter woman being seen with a naval officer, most people we've spoken to so far said she was always alone. But we've tracked down some other witnesses who saw her in company. Let's get back on the hotel trail in Bergen, starting with the Neptune Hotel. We're up in a in a room which used to be the restaurant, I believe, and it seems to be a little bit frozen in time. It seems to have the light fittings from the 70s with that smoked glass and a mirror on the ceiling and a sort of fading chandelier. And we're looking out onto the main road. We are here because we know that the woman uh, stayed in this hotel for several nights and she was having her breakfast in exact this room back then. And also she had dinner here. At least one time, because you, you remember that, Lilian Menes Körner, you were serving her. To dinner and to breakfast, yes. Can you picture her here now? Has, has much changed in this no, room? No, uh, just the same. Sitting here at the table and uh, she has a black process and a white uh, top and, and yeah, <laughs> she uh, had sad eyes, very sad, not smiling, very serious. And the next day I served her dinner. She was with a man. Alvoli. She had a serious face. Yeah. Yes. And uh, don't say much. Yeah. And they speak, they speak Deutsch. She was speaking German? Yes. Yes. To, to the staff? Yes. Was it a different language with the man? Did you hear anything no, from the conversation? Don't, don't conversation. This is only eat ah. and... Uh, he sit with one paper and uh, she uh, don't say anything. They were silent. Yes. Uh, a, piece, a sheet of paper? Yes, not newspaper. Was he writing or reading? No, she or? is reading the paper. But they were sitting together because yes. they knew each other? Yes. But that you didn't see them talk to each no. other? No. Was that strange? Yes. <laughs> they, uh, he looked at the paper and he, uh, she is sitting and looking at him. So it wasn't a romantic dinner no, or something? No. Not romantic. Was it more like a, a meeting between the two yes. of them? Yes. It looked like on the paper, all the paper on the table. and uh, Yes. So they didn't speak with each other, and it looked like a meeting. I wonder what kind of meeting. I can only imagine there was uh, information being passed from her to him or him to her, and who knows what was on that piece of paper. It's not a very discreet place to have a meeting if it was a sort of a secret meeting. But not one that they were particularly enjoying. Again and again with the witnesses we've spoken to, we've always taken them back to the place where they saw the Estal woman. And they have such vivid recollections of her, whatever she was doing, how she interacted with people. 47 years on, it really is striking how, how much of an impression she made on people. For Lillian, it was so spooky, the whole scene being back there again. She didn't even want to sit on the same chair where the Isla woman was sitting back then. Do you remember the man? Anything about the man? Yes, he had grey hair. Did he look Norwegian? Yes, he could be. What is in the police yes. statements? Should Lillian read it? Yeah. Wednesday, the 16 12th, 17 o'clock, 15.40. Uh, på arbetsstäd. Då hette jag alltså Lillian Menes Nilsson. Yes. So, but then there is nothing about a man in no, this police no, report. No. I told uh, they has dinner. I don't know why uh, why it's not uh, come. In the police. Department. Yes, yes. I don't know. Not a word about the, no. this dinner, no. No. this meeting with no. the man. What you no. t- told the police yeah. about? Yes. Strange. Yes. It's really weird. The only evidence the police have been given to lead them to another individual and they ignore it. Could they have been given orders not to pursue that lead? 
Maybe, but why? The amount of police documents show that they did a thorough investigation. It's odd that they didn't pursue a crucial lead like this, and that they didn't even write down her full witness testimony. It is indeed. And there's one more place you wanted to show me before we leave the Hotel Neptune. We're in her room, the hotel where she stayed several nights. We know now it was known as a fine hotel. And I have some descriptions here from the police, witness descriptions. This witness is actually dead, but she gives some very good descriptions of this woman. She says... Is this, is this another worker in the hotel? This is a worker in the hotel. She was a, how do you say, roommate? She, yeah, chambermaid, roommate. Chambermaid, roommate. And she saw this woman several times, and she says when she was in the hotel and went to and from the toilet, which was obviously in the corridor, mm -hmm. not in the room. She was dressed in a um, turquoise-colored uh, long bathrobe. But when she went out from the hotel, uh, this witness describes that she was wearing a black leather hat. And she had a long scarf, and she had a jacket. Ah, here's a description from inside the room. It says she had two suitcases placed under the desk. Mm -hmm. The right She's still here. Then she says this lady did something with a table which normally was placed under the window. This table she had moved and turned upside down and put it out in the hallway towards the door. Strange thing to do. Back then, it was a small entrance. Like a in hallway the room, inside in the, room. the room. Yeah, yeah inside the room. Would that be kind and of blocking she, the door? Maybe she used it for that. Mm -hmm. And when the maid saw it, it was taken to the side. So here she is, moving the furniture around again. Let's continue. There are more mystery men. Siri Reichvan was a young worker in a home furnishing shop in Bergen in 1970 when in walked the Istal woman. She was coming together with this man uh, into the shop where I worked and were going to buy a mirror. So they were discussing quite a lot before they finally found a mirror that was not too small and, and not expensive, just uh, one of the cheapest that we had, yes. A mirror? A mirror, yes. Was it kind of a mirror which you were holding in the hand? No, no. no. It was a mirror to hang on the wall. It was about this size, a meter, meter and a half. Yeah. At that time, I didn't think about it, but um, they were both foreigners, and I couldn't really... Uh, ex they didn't speak English, they didn't speak... Uh, it wasn't uh, German. I, I, so we were discussing afterwards, where did I come from? Even if I don't speak it, I could feel it wasn't Italian, it wasn't English, it wasn't... German. German, no. Mm. She had dark hair, brown eyes, and they looked Eastern Europe, something like that. Do you remember, how was she? Her hair was in sort of untidy curls. <laughs> yes. And he was dark. They were both dark, yes. Mm -hmm. It was not like they were very friendly to each other. It didn't sound like it was friendly. I did talk to the police at that time. Does it say anything in the records about that? Did I ask about that? No. No, it, it's several witnesses actually mm -hmm. told about a man that she was together with a man or met yeah. with a man yes. or had dinner with a man. Mm. But the police didn't seem to be too much interested in that. And that's kind of strange, yes. I think. Yes. Because when you're trying to find out who the person was, you actually have to try to yes. find the person's yes. knowing this person. Mm. Yes. I think. Yeah, that's strange, yes. Like I said, they were sort of arguing when they were buying this. They weren't smiling or anything like that. They were sort of, oh, yeah. <laughs> to 
together with a man arguing in an Eastern European language, buying a large mirror. Why would you buy a mirror from a shop when you're staying at a hotel? Evidently, she paid a lot of attention to the way she looked. She, she had makeup, she had wigs, she had face creams. But this is a, a mirror that you would hang on the wall, not something you'd have in your handbag. And what she says about untidy curls, that brings me to think she must have been wearing the wig that day. Because what we know about uh, the Isla woman's hair was that it was straight and and. She was dark-haired and it was straight, but we also know about the wig, that the wig was a short hair wig and with a lot of curls. And she's attracting attention, which to my mind doesn't feel very much like spy behavior, where you'd want to keep a low profile. There is another key hotel in Bergen, the Rosenkranz Hotel, where she stayed for just one night on the 18th of November 1970 as Elisabeth Lenhofer. We'll join the crime writer Gunnar Stolesen again and Torfinn Sande, who has been caretaker of the hotel for decades. Here she stayed from the 18th to the 19th of November 1970. So one night she stayed as Elisabeth Lehenhofer, the same name she used at Horda Heimann. Yeah. So this was the hotel before Horda Heimann. Mm -hmm. So this was definitely of the last period where she was alive. And she had room number 426, and we are supposed to see that room now. Okay. Tiara? When did you start working here? 19, before 1970? No, I started working here uh, 23 in uh, June uh, 72. 72? Wow. Uh, you remember the day? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's impressive. Uh, yeah. So. Turn on. Hard, what was it? 426 was yeah. her room. How would the room have been then? The room has been the, the same. What I have here is a, a quite an interesting witness description given to the police back then. She was a roommate here in Hotel Rosenkranz. And she's telling the police about one evening, the roommate locked herself into this room to make the bed for the evening because that was usual at that time. They, the roommates made the bed for the evening. And when she got inside, she she got a shock because on the bed, there were this lady sitting. And in a small couch uh, beside the bed, there was a man sitting. And the witness, the roommate, she was uh, apologizing, sorry, sorry, and wanted to, to go out again. And she was sorry that she didn't knock the door. At the same time, she asked if she could please do the bed and the blanket, and here comes the strangest part. The woman got up from bed without saying a word. She let the roommate do the work, and the roommate was in a hurry and left again. And when she left, neither the man or the woman in the room said one word to this maid <laughs> during this, I don't know, minutes. But this is another witness telling about seeing a man together with the Ice Valley woman. Good night. What does your crime writing mind make of that? No, uh, uh, mysterious. Is it uh, the same man as another witness uh, saw with her at the restaurant? We don't know. Because we haven't the precise uh, description of this man. The other man was, he had white hair, didn't he? That you met at the restaurant. There was an older man. Uh, mm. In the Neptune. At the Neptune, now, here yes. Here we have a description of both of them, actually. But you're right, the, the different witnesses describe the man... Mm -hmm. or the man differently. Yeah. So it's here, this roommate in here in Rosenkranz, she describes the woman with dark hair, beautiful face, dark eyes, pretty skin in the face, black dress, and seemed like she was in sorrow in some way. She was thinking she must have grief because she looked so sad. And this roommate, she just describes the man as around 25 to 30 years old. Tall, well-built, yes, broad shoulders, 
blonde hair, nice face, and he was dressed in a gray colored suit. Suit, yeah. yeah. And then we're back to this strange thing about the police work. It seems like they didn't actually do too much to find this man or men. No. Mm. Strange. Yeah. <laughs> Special feeling to be in a in a room. Every hotel room has a story, doesn't it? You just wonder what was it that made her move across town after one night? Yeah, mm. why didn't she just stay here? Why did she move on the other side of the harbour to Hotel Hordeheimen mm. after one night here? I don't know. But she was looking, it seems like she was looking for a room where she could watch the street. There's the same, more or less here. For sure she had contacts in Bergen and various rendezvous with men, and the police apparently weren't interested. So who was the man or men? In the Hotel Neptune restaurant, the witness thought he may have been Norwegian. But in the shop, buying the mirror, the witness thinks Eastern European. In the Rosenkrantz hotel room, they didn't speak at all when the maid came in. But she was connected somehow to people here. And none of those men came forward when the police called for witnesses after her death. They must have been keeping a secret. There's been speculation in our Facebook group that she may have been a prostitute. Remember the matchbox found inside the suitcases, which had the label of an erotic underwear mail order service in Germany? Now it's a chain of famous sex shops. Was that side of the story ever looked into? Yes, The matchbox found in her suitcase is actually one of more things that have made uh, prostitution theory to one of the main theories during almost 50 years because it pointed to a postal order shop in Germany selling erotic underwear at that time. The other thing found in the suitcases that points towards maybe uh, some sort of prostitution could be that it was a lot of underwear there and, and uh, sophisticated underwear. But to bring the link to prostitution, for me, it doesn't make sense because I read about all the contents in the suitcases and this didn't seem to be uh, erotic underwear, it's more normal underwear, beautiful but not erotic underwear. And to make a woman to prostitute because of the content in the suitcases containing underwear, that's for me... A shortcut. Yeah, or a bit of a leap. Yes, and, and also this matchbox, is, it isn't a strong proof for anything actually because she could have picked up this matchbox in any lobby or bar left there by some German soldiers, which we know were in Bergen at that time. And there's another thing concerning me about the prostitution theory. If we think that this woman was a prostitute, why did she then check into Christian hotels where it was not allowed to drink alcohol and it was quite strict rules for guests? We know she did that, amongst other, in Hordeheimen, was this kind of hotel in Bergen where she spent her last days. And also St. Svitun in Stavanger was a Christian hotel and we know that she spent nine days there if she was a prostitute it would be a strange place to stay if she wanted to do her job so to say it'd be very noticeable yeah she couldn't ply her trade and not be seen or spotted whatever she was doing she was on the move a lot from city to city hotel to hotel, sometimes even room to room. Our former KGB spy, Alexander Vasilyev, has a theory connected with her movements. We took him through her coded route. So that's the system. We, we don't have all the codes. We have some of them, cities that she visited. So she was in Norwegian cities, four different cities. We know she was in... Hamburg, in Germany, in Basel, in Switzerland. We know she was in Paris, in France. We know she was in Rome, in Italy. She could be a courier, I mean, a messenger. Because she traveled so much. A courier for someone else. Because, let's say, you have a spy 
interested in the testing field for those uh, penguin missiles. The spy would be living in that area, staying in that area, trying to gather as much information as possible, establishing contacts with local people, with farmers or fishermen, something like that. So he wouldn't be traveling uh, so often around Europe because th that wasn't his task. His task was to, you know, to get information about the missile. Now, if she was somehow involved in espionage activities, she looks like uh, she was a courier passing information, let's say, from a person who lived in that area to the headquarters of that espionage organization, to the handler. I would say that if a spy was given uh, such a serious task, he would be sitting in, the, in, in, in that area. Staying there. Yeah, she... she, she he didn't. He didn't have to to, to travel. So there is no need for it. He would be blending, trying to blend in, or to to make some friends. I mean, it it, uh, it would it would take a lot of time. Yeah. It could fit this with courier uh, when we think about that in this missile test area. She wasn't actually seen trying to enter a boat or something like that. She was seen talking to an officer on the quay. So maybe she was there to pick up information. Or to pass information. I mean, it works both ways. I think we'll break this case right now. Well, it looks to me like there was an espionage ring operating in that area possibly involving some uh, Norwegian officials. And she was a courier for that uh, espionage ring. And she did some mistake. They killed her. They put her body on fire. And they, they tried to cover up the whole story because some top-ranking Norwegian officials uh, were involved. That's it. It's a theory. Next time in Death in Ice Valley, the police investigation is suddenly shut down. <laughs>